Good day, grade 11s. Welcome to this next and last lesson on physical science for the year. Um, we're going to carry on just with working through questions in relation to your possible exams. I know with physical science that they do different things depending on your school. Sometimes they cover all the content and sometimes they cover only part of the content for the final exam. I'm going to carry on working through the physics and then when we finish going through the physics I will move on to chemistry questions. It says a block of mass 8 kilograms is resting on a rough horizontal surface so you know that if it's rough there is a very high chance of there being friction, very strong chance of there being friction. It's connected by a light inextensible string. What does that mean? It means that it's connected by a light string which doesn't, um, isn't affected by the, in other words, the light string doesn't affect any of the forces. It doesn't cause friction. It doesn't cause extra mass, nothing. Okay, so basically it's not actually affecting anything in this whole setup, okay? It passes of a light frictionless pulley dotto, in an, to another block of mass 5 kilograms, right? The 5 kilogram block hangs vertically as shown. There's a 15 newton force that is applied to the 8 kilogram block at an angle of 30 degrees horizontal, causing the block to slide to the left. So the block is actually sliding to the left. And because of the fact that all of these things are vectors, I'm going to choose direction as positive. And the direction I'm choosing positive is the direction it's moving to. So I'm choosing a left as positive. And you guys have to, have to, have to give an indication of which side, which way you're deciding to be positive or negative. If they don't tell you, you get to choose. And it really doesn't matter which way you go as long as you choose intelligently. And you keep that step, keep to it again. Okay. There it says the coefficient of the kinetic friction between the block and the surface of the table is 0 0.25. So mu k is 0, 0.25. Right, so we knew there was a force of friction. It says draw a free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the 8 kilogram blocks. So they want the, all the forces act in the 8 kilogram block, but please note they asked for a free body diagram. The first thing you need to think about when you're doing a free body diagram is the fact that you need to draw a dot or a colored in, colored in circle. You can't draw a square, you can't draw a rectangle, you can't draw a car. If it involves a car in the question, you can't do any of that, okay? It has to, has to, has to be a dot, a colored in circle. Right, now, what do we know? We know that there is the force of gravity and guys, please use a pencil and use a ruler. And if you make mistakes, don't cross it out. Use an eraser. It is very important, okay? There is the normal force, F normal, which is obviously the force of the table holding it up. Then there's the force applied, F applied which is at an angle of 30 degrees. I know mine doesn't look like 30 degrees, but it's fine. And there is a force of friction. Okay, so force applied, force of friction, normal force, and force of gravity. Those are the four forces acting on this free body diagram. Now it says write down Newton's second law of motion in words. So guys, you cannot write F net equals ma. It is true that that is Newton's second law, that f net is equal to ma, but the problem is by just writing f net equals ma, you haven't obeyed the instructions, so you'll get zero marks for it, okay? What do you need to do? You need to say that when a net force acts on an object, that object will of mass m, that object will accelerate with a force that is directly proportional to the force applied, I mean, direct, the, the object will accelerate with an acceleration that is directly proportional to the net force applied to it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Right, you need to practice it, okay guys? Seriously, this is very important. Um, they love asking th theory and theory can count up to 10% of your exam. So by not studying your theory, you can easily lose 
up to 10% of your exam. Okay, so it's kind of silly to not study your theory. Um, right, now it says, calculate the magnitude of the normal force acting on the eight kilograms. They want the normal force, this normal force here. Okay, the normal force is acting on it. Okay, but now this is tricky, okay, because before we would go, oh, well, if, if this 15 newtons is not here, okay, this 15 newtons wasn't here, then do you agree that only two four vertical forces acting on this object would be the normal force up and the force of gravity down, right? But now there is this applied force. So the applied force can actually be broken up into the horizontal component and the vertical component okay so this is f applied vertical and this is f applied horizontal right and do you see that these two because this eight kilogram does not leave the surface it slides along but it says the block slides to the left it doesn't say anything about the block being lifted off the surface that means that these two the f have i mean the vertical component of the applied force plus an normal force has to equal the force of gravity. Has to equal the force of gravity. Another way to think of it is if net perpendicular vertically, it has to be zero. Okay, because this object doesn't move up or down, it only moves from the left to the right. Okay, if that's the case, then do you agree that the sum of all the forces, remember it's the sum of all the forces, is going to be the force, normal force, plus the force average, I mean, not average, the vertical component of the applied force, plus the force of gravity has to equal zero, right? Now, we need to choose a positive and a negative direction. I'm going to choose, it really doesn't matter, so I'm going to choose up as positive. That means zero is going to equal the normal force, which we we're trying to find out, plus the vertical component of the applied force, okay, um, plus minus the force of gravity. I'm doing this really slowly. Right, so now let's work out this normal force. The normal force is, that's what we're trying to work out is the normal force, okay? The force that at the vertical component of the applied force. The applied force is 15. This is the opposite side, so we need Sakatoa. We've got the hypotenuse of 15. We want the opposite side, so we're going to use sine. So this is going to be um, 15 sine 30 degrees opposite of our hypotenuse here. So this is 15 sine 30 degrees. When I take the normal force across, it becomes minus the normal force, okay, minus the force of gravity on this object, which is just 8 times 9, 8. Happy with that? So let's now, unfortunately, my screen calculator side. So let me just multiply this on the calculator next to me and then that is let me just check it it's going to be 15 sine what did we say 30 yeah and and that works out to be 7.5 so this is 7.5 minus 8 times 9.8 is 78 comma 4 and this is minus Fn. So 78,4 minus 7.5 is 17.9. So minus Fn is equal to minus 70,9 newtons. Therefore, the normal force is 70,9 newtons. So this normal force is 70,9 newtons. That one there. Okay, right. Now we've done that. Now it says work out the tension, the string connecting the two blocks. Okay, so what I always tell my students is that no matter how many 
free body diagrams or force body diagrams that ask you to draw in a question like this, I would always, always, always draw the free body diagram or force diagram for each of the components. In other words, when I started the question before I even read the question, I personally would have drawn a rough sketch similar to what you're seeing there because obviously I haven't used a ruler and drawn it to scale as best I could. So for me, there would be, this would be for the eight kilogram and then yeah, for me, there would be another dot for the five kilogram where this would be the force of gravity and that, oh, I forgot the tension. Okay, sorry. Not that it matters, thank goodness. I did it last time as well. There's also the tension, the tension. And this would be the tension. Okay, so there's a force of gravity. In fact, let me just redraw that because it isn't to scale now. There's the tension up and there's the force of gravity down. Right. Okay, so now what do we know? We want to know what is the tension in the string connecting the two blocks. Okay, so do you agree that this tension is also equal to this, okay? So if we looked at the horizontal component working on eight, on, on the eight, the horizontal components, okay, we know that it is being moved to the left. It is definitely moving to the left, okay, sliding to the left. So we've got F net, and we're talking horizontal now, is going to be the F, a H okay plus T plus the force of friction okay you with me so this is for the eight kilogram this is for the eight kilogram okay so we know that the mass times acceleration is going to be the horizontal component of this which is going to be 30 cos Let's try again. It's going to be 15 cos 30. It's going to be 15 cos 30. Okay, plus T. The force of friction is mu K F N. Okay. So the mass of the 8 kilograms is 8. So it's 8A is equal to, let's work out what 15 cos 30 is. So it's 15 cos 30 equals 12,99. So it's 12,99 plus T plus the mu K we worked out to be 0, 0,25. We were given that. And the normal force we worked out to be 70.9. So that's going to be 0, 0, 0,25 times 70.9 which is 17.25 17 comma 73 shall I say now there's a problem I've been doing this but I haven't assigned my positives and negatives yet I've just been doing it as a sum do you agree that because of the directions because these are vectors if I've chosen to the left as positive this is positive that's fine the horizontal force is positive the tension is actually negative and the friction is negative okay so now we need to rewrite this finally so it's going to be 8a is equal to 12,99 minus t minus 17,73 and that's equation one now we've got equation two for the five kilogram and that's why we need the second drawing so the second drawing has also got an F net, F net is equal to the T plus the force of gravity. Remember, you always write positives because we're showing that we know that the sum of all the forces is positive, right? So this is going to be 5A is equal to T minus the force of gravity, which in this case is just going to be 5 times by 9 comma 8. Okay, so 5 times 9.8 is 49. So we've got 5a is equal to t minus 49. 
So those are our two equations. Do you agree? We've got, I just need to raise some stuff. We've got 8a is equal to 12.99 minus t minus 17.73, which I can make neater, which I will do now. And then we've got this 5a is equal to t minus 49. Now I'm kind of hesitant to solve both of these for t because then I end up having to solve for a and then multiplying in. So let's see if I can find a way to solve just for t. Okay, so do you agree that this became 8a is equal to 12.9 no, let's try again. 12.99 minus 17.73 is minus minus 4,74 minus t, that's equation one. And equation two is 5a is equal to t minus 49. Okay, so if I just add these two equations, what do I get? I get three, eight plus five is gonna be 13. So we get 13a is equal to the t cancels with the minus t. And we add this, we get 49 plus bracket minus, so it's just 49, 49 minus 4.74, which is, oh, I meant plus, 49 minus 49 minus 4.74, which is 53, comma 74, which when you divide by 13 becomes 4.133, meters per second squared. So that is my acceleration. My acceleration is 4,13 meters per second squared. But now we wanted the tension. We wanted the tension. So we know the tension is going to equal 5a plus 49. So that's going to be 5 times the 4.13 plus the 49, which gives you 69.67. So it's 69,67 newtons. And there you go. That is the tension, the strain connecting the two blocks. Right, on to the next question. It says objects. It says, write down Newton's law of universal gravitation. Write down Newton's law of universal gravitation. So if you go look on your formula sheet, you will see F is equal to big G M1 M2 over R squared. And that is actually Newton's law of universal gravitation. But they've asked you to write it in words. So writing it out like that is actually going to be kind of useless, you'd think. But what you need to know is that this actually gives us a clue as to how to write it if we haven't studied it, so if we've been naughty. So if we know that, for instance, we can say, well, the force, the net force between two objects is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the distance between their center squared. There you go. Not too bad. Now it says an object weighing 140 newtons on the surface of the earth. Okay, so yeah, is the earth and there is the object and it has a weight, a ma weighs, weighs 140 newtons. It's moved to position, oh hang on, again, I need to know things like the height of the earth. Okay, we can't do this. Okay, and we've done this question. Let's look at this one, it's a nice one. Okay, so we're moving on to chemistry now. Sorry, I skipped this questions because we've actually done them ad nauseum in when we've been going through those sections. So I thought it might be more profitable for us to go through questions on sections as well, the questions we haven't done yet. So now it says, the graph below shows the change in energy takes place when a hydrogen atom approaches a bromine atom. So you go, here's your hydrogen here. Okay, and it's approaching the bromine, okay. As it gets closer and closer, what happens to the energy? The energy decreases, it goes down, down, and down, down, until it gets to a specific energy, okay? Called the bond energy, this is called the bond energy. And at that point, the energy 
of the molecules at its lowest. As you go up, so you'll increase the energy required again. So find the term bond length. The bond length is basically the distance between two, um, the radii of two um, atoms. Okay. It says from the graph, write down the bond length in picometers of the HBr. So the bond length is going to be this length here. It's basically the distance from the center of the radius or the distance between the nuclei. So you can see that this is 120, that's 240, that's 360. So that's 120 is that whole gap. Halfway between them is approximately 60 picometers. Now they want the energy in kilojoules per mole that is needed to break the hydrogen bond. So this bit here is the energy required to break the bond. Okay, so we know that so because it's the least amount of energy and then after that the energy goes up. So that there is going to be 350 kilojoules per mole. Now it says name the potential energy represented by E, and I've already told you, it's the bond energy, the energy required to break the bond. Finally, it says, how will the bond length of AHF, hydrogen fluoride, compare to that of hydrogen bromide? Okay, so what you need to do is go look at your periodic table. And when you go look at your periodic table, you can see where fluorine is relating to bromine. So if you look at your periodic table on group seven, group seven, you should see fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and acetine. And what you need to realize is that as you go further down, your molecule is actually bigger, your atoms are bigger. And the reason is because they've got more electron shells, okay, more of them. So do you agree that the hydrogen fluoride is a much smaller um, atom or molecule than hydrogen bromide and therefore the energy to break those bonds or to add those bonds on is much higher so therefore we can say that it is going to be bond uh, so for the bond length oh sorry because the bond energy is higher we also know that the fluorine is a much smaller molecule which means that the bond length is going to be shorter than much shorter than why because it's a smaller atom Okay, now it says both aluminium fluoride and phosphorus trifluoride, P53, contain fluorine. Aluminium fluoride is a colorless solid used in the production of aluminium, whilst phosphorus trifluoride is a poisonous colorless gas. Okay, explain the difference between covalent bonding and ionic bonding. Okay, so the most important thing to remember here is that when you explain the difference between covalent bonding and ionic bonding, though it is good to understand the theory behind it in the sense that the one is about sharing, the other one is about only transferring electrons, etc., etc., it's a bad way to explain the difference in the exams. You need to actually be a little bit more technical than that, okay? So you need to be specific about what you say. So what are we saying? Explain the difference between covalent bond. A covalent bond is when the electrons are shared between the two atoms, two or more atoms, whereas the ionic bond refers to the transfer, transfer of electrons. Right, so now it says name the type of chemical bond between the particles in. Okay, so now what we need to do is look at our periodic table to look at the read and what they have okay so let's have a look at this so we've got aluminium fluoride so aluminium is in group three and it has electronegativity of one comma five whereas fluorine has electronegativity of four so if we take fluorine and we subtract 1.5, it's greater than 2, therefore we can say it's ionically bonded. PF3 is phosphorus, P, phosphorus, which is 2.1 from 4. So it's 4 minus 2.1, which is going to be 1,9. So actually this is going to be polar covalent, covalent. Now it says draw Lewis structures for aluminium fluoride and PF3. 
Okay, so we want Lewis structures for aluminium fluoride and PA3. Now let's think about this first. What group is aluminium fluoride in? Aluminium is in group what? It is in group three. Okay, so and fluorine is in group seven, so it's got seven valence electrons and aluminium has got five valence electrons. So if we could, we could go aluminium and it is in group three, so it is going to be one, two, three, that's it. But now what happens is that this splits up. Okay, it splits up and we end up with an aluminium like this and we end up with fluorine, fluorine and fluorine. So it's aluminium trifluoride. Phosphorus on the other hand is in group five. So phosphorus is in group five. So let's think what that means. Um, if you think about it, you can see that phosphorus is in group five. So the way it works is it has got P, which is going to be, because it's in group five, it's going to be one, two, three, four, five. And you'll see that again, it's got these beautiful spaces. So it is going to be, um, I haven't quite sorted that out, I'll sort that out in a minute. That's going to be there, 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 and that is going to be F, F, F. Um, okay, so just give me half a second to think about the aluminium fluoride. Because it is, yeah, I'm right. Because it is ionic, um, that is, I mean, that is exactly it. Okay. Right, everybody happy with that? Now it says write down the molecular shape of PF3. The molecular shape of PF3. Well, look at it. What do you think it looks like? Do you see that it's got a lone pair over there? Um, lone pair. So what does that mean? That means it is repelling its other three shared pairs of electrons. Okay. Um, so do you see that this P here is actually going to be repelling these three shapes here. So that means that what is the molecular shape of P of three? Well, if we think about it, let's think it's going to, these are going to be repel each other and these are going to repel then do you agree that it is going to be definitely trigonal? Okay. Because it's going to have a triangle for a base. And because of the fact that it goes up to a point, what does that look like? Let me draw it again for you a bit bigger. You see you've got P, yeah, and there's your two points, and then you've got fluorine, fluorine, and fluorine, and it's dot, 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 cross, cross, cross. So there is your trigonal, and there is your pyramidal. So this is gonna be trigonal, pyramidal, trigonal, Pyramidal. Okay, the melting point of aluminium fluoride is 1291, whereas that is PF3 is minus 151. Explain the difference. Okay, well, first of all, aluminium fluoride is an ionic. And because it's an ionic, they've got much stronger um, intramolecular forces, and therefore, it's obviously going to be more difficult to melt it or decrease its um, strength. Similarly, um, it also, whereas PF3 is obviously um, a covalent bond, therefore it is much weaker, it has much weaker intermolecular forces. 
Similarly, you've got the fact that aluminum fluoride is going to form a macromolecule. Since it is a, um, a covalent bond and a polar, polar covalent bond to boot, it's actually going to become a, I mean, sorry, the LF3 is not a polar covalent, it is ionic, and because it's ionic, it's going to form a um, huge crystal lattice, which also means that it's going to have a way higher melting point. Right, now it says the boiling point of four carbon compounds of hydrogen, represented by letters P, Q, R, and S, are given. So here are the boiling points. Minus 164, 30, minus 33, 100, and minus 112. It says define the term boiling point. Now what's important about the term boiling point is that you need to realize that this is a temperature at which the particles boil compared to um, just vaguely evaporate. Okay, so in other words, it is a temperature at which the object will change phase. Fully explain the difference in boiling points with, between compound P and that of compound R. Okay, so if you look at the electronegativities of these two, um, it says, explain by referring to electronegativity and degree of polarity. Okay, do you agree that high, water actually looks like this? There's a high oxygen and two hydrogens, whereas methane is a carbon here with a hydrogen, um, a hydrogen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, right? So in other words, everywhere I work, I'm looking at the methane, I'm seeing a hydrogen. Whereas over here, I see the hydrogens, but if I came to this side, I wouldn't see the hydrogens at all, okay? So now it's saying, explain the components between compounds P and, um, first of all, Q. P and Q, and then P and S, okay? So do you agree the compound P is going to be methane? It looks like this, that's a carbon in the middle. Now let me just try again. Let me draw it a much nicer picture. Methane. Is carbon and then it's got one, two, three, four hydrogens placed around it very nice and neatly. Um, and then compound S is silicon hydride, silicon hydride, and that's interesting as well. I'll talk to you about that in a second. Silicon hydride is got hydrogen atoms, but is not hydrogen bonded. Okay, right. So the important thing about this the compound. I did it again. I did methane instead of compound Q, which is ammonia. What is wrong with me? Let's do this. It's got to be compound Q, which is ammonia. So ammonia is nitrogen with three hydrogens like this, and it's got a free pair of unpaired electrons. Okay. So now it says fully extend the difference in boiling points by looking at compound P and compound Q, okay? So compound P has got, both of them have got hydrogens, okay? But compound P has got, okay, and they meet it. Um, whereas ammonia, so ammonia has got, it's gonna have a lower boiling point. Um, I mean, methane is going to be a lower boiling point than ammonia. And the reason for that is because ammonia, the way it's bonded, is um, nitrogen is 3 and hydrogen is 2.1, so that is still covalent. But if you remember the way it looks, is that it's got this free pair of electrons, okay, whereas methane is going to have a much lower boiling point um, because this hydrogen is very easy to remove. Okay, so that's Q. Let's look at S between P and S. That's pretty easy because silicon hydride is actually um, a very 
easily um, boiled. You can see it boils at minus 112. In fact, it prefers to be in the gas state. It prefers to be in the gas state. And the reason for this is because it doesn't have very strong intermolecular forces. Okay, grade 11s, that's it for our lessons for this year. Please go study very hard and make sure you understand everything. And then, yeah, just go practice, practice, practice. Have a great day and a great year. Bye.